system to remove the, the debris that gets trapped within the tanks. Um, so it rained the other day, rainwater runoff and sewage combined went into this tank to be stored uh, while the system was at capacity. But while these tanks are storing flow, grit, sand, other heavier debris settles out to the bottom floatable material, plastic bottles, rubber balls, plastic bags rise to the top. At automated facilities where we have a head house, like in Patagon, Flushing Bay, and Spring Creek, that material is automatically removed in a head house in an odor controlled space. We don't have to do what we see here, but at Alley Creek, this facility, it has to be done manually. So every couple of months or so, we capture so many storms, grit accumulates at the bottom of this tank below us, plastics float to the top, and the guys have to come in with this arrangement and manually remove the material. So the first thing we do is we have to set up a ventilation this truck here, just has fans in there that remove all of the odorous air that's trapped in the tank so that our guys can get in. So that odorous air is then blown out. Um, you know, we're fortunate here that there's really nobody living around the area. Because if you go over there, you'll smell the odorous air getting pulled out. Already. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we have crews that go into the tank using this big vacuum truck you see behind us. It's called a vacuum truck. Um, you heard the noise from there before. And they go in there with a long hose and they suck out the grit. They go down into different hatches, suck out the grit that's in there. As that vector truck, the cylinder behind the truck gets full, it then gets dumped into a container here. Uh, you can see the grit. We'll take you over there to look at that. And then as that container gets full, we have trucks coming in, picking up the container, taking a full container out, bringing a fresh, empty container back in, and the process starts all over again. Yes? So that goes to a landfill actually goes to a, a processing facility that we own at Wards Island first and then to a landfill. Um, four, four, four million gallons. So this is four million. Uh, we haven't finally decided yet on what the size of, of, of the Gowanus tank is going to be. It's probably going to be between four million and eight million gallons. EPA is proposing eight million, which would be twice as big as this. Uh, DEP thinks, you know, based upon the math that we've done, it could be smaller, uh, but that's still to be decided. Yeah, so the footprint goes to, yeah, so, go ahead. Show the footprint, Paul. Uh, the actual structure is from the curb all the way to where you see kind of like where this boom is. And then where you're standing, where right here, the actual two barrels are right here. And that's where all the four main gallons are being. Right. So when you drove in, that's kind of where the, the, the tank starts. And then it ends up, if you see that green sign, that's the outfall. So when this tank... If it's a very heavy rain event, and not only the sewer system is exceeding capacity, but this tank exceeds capacity, there's an overflow into Alley Creek. And we're going to take it down there. So these are long tanks? These are 
long, right, long, and, and so what we intend to build at Gowanus would be deeper, more rectangular than this very, you know, long, long yeah. narrow. Right. We have a guy the, in the, the, tank. the footprint would be about, what is it? Uh, for the larger tank, it's about 50, 60,000 square feet. About 50,000, 50 to 60,000 square feet. And the head house doesn't cover the whole side of the tank. The head house uh, that we think we'll be using will be about 25,000, yeah, 25, 25 to 30,000 square feet. But this is a long tank. And the reason I'm asking this is because we have an old guy in our tag who's always thinking that a long tank can be put under there's no room because of all the utilities. That's that's the problem. You have gas, electric. Um, it, it's just you know water and sewer lines. Uh, exactly. Uh, again, there's probably cable in there. It's yeah. just so many things in, in street beds. Yeah. So I think that uh, the commissioner mentioned that every few weeks or a couple months you have to clean up what it Yeah, it's dry. It could be every three months. If it's wetter, it's more frequently. But of course. You know, it's a, the question of you have to constantly be monitoring to be sure that yeah. you're not reducing the capacity of the tank. Sure. Um, and if it gets wetter, you have to do it more to frequently. And so every time you do one of these uh, cleaning out events, about how many of these bins over here will you so, fill? So again, it depends upon rainfall intensity, frequency, okay. a lot of things. But these guys, so they, they started cleaning today. You know, we wanted to, to show you guys how it's done. They'll be here for about a week. So. When they come here, they clean, you know, every two to three months. This facility, it takes about a week to get all of the, the material out. Can I ask you another question? About six, okay. So, John, John just told me, so these containers, they fill up about six, six to ten, to ten uh, every time they do clean. When you get all that work on the flushing tunnel down to Russell, you had the same problems with utilities and things like that there, too. That already existed. Right. Yeah, the only utility work we had to do associated with the, uh, with the pump station and flushing tunnel upgrade was getting new power into the facility. Um, all the other work um, was was contained to our site. We weren't that doing a lot of street work. It's the same time that a lot of other that, that tunnel was built 100 years ago. Yeah. Right. Is, um, does the having a headhouse change the amount of material that is produced? No, it'll be the same amount of material that gets trapped in the tank. Um, but the head house, it just is an odor controlled space and everything is done automatically. So instead of having a vector truck and guys having to go down to scoop everything out, there'll be mechanical systems, which we have at our facilities in Patigan, Flushing Bay and Spring Creek. Everything is done automatically within an odor controlled space. Whatever goes into a container, the container is also inside the building in an odor controlled space. And our guys at the end of the day would shrink wrap the container before it gets removed. Right, so one of the big one of the big differences is with the head house, you're not seeing or smelling exactly what the cleaning is, which here you, you or, will or in just here. Yeah. Or here. As, as we, you know, when we yeah, turn yeah. on the piece yeah. of equipment, yeah, I mean, it makes it more. And you really just have to cart the, the uh, containers away. You don't have to have all of the other equipment that we have here to do the work. So the, but the, the number of pickups would be the same, but just the shorter amount of time, it's expedited. That's right. Because right. it's automated trucks it's coming and taking the stuff out. It's, 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 it's for, yeah. for all this equipment. Well, yeah, I mean, basically the footprint, if, if we didn't have to ventilate, the, you have to put the ventilation unit down, down there today because the ground was a little squishy from the rain the other day. Um, but if we had the ventilation truck here where it normally is, I mean, you can see the footprint is not super big. Have to set up and break down every day and close down, probably close down streets for periods of time in order, in, in well, order to do yeah, this operation. That's a good point, too. So, here, you know, we're out in an open field. We, we've got plenty of room to, to move in and out as we please. When the guys do work, they, they basically, you know, set up at, at 6 30 or 7 o'clock in the morning, work, work through the day. They're not disturbing people, making noise, making smells. Uh, you know, we just feel that in the Gowanus neighborhood, Everything is just more compressed. You have residences, businesses, basically got to be right on top of the tank. Probably makes sense to have a head house where everything is enclosed. You won't get the noise, you won't get the smells into the neighborhood. Which we I, have in all of our tanks where we have adjacent uses nearby. So I was going to ask about that. When this was built versus when the other, other three facilities were built, what led to the decision not to have a head house here versus to have park, a head parks, house? Parks Department saw this as a, as a good green open space and felt that, nah, do we really need a head house? And at the time we said, well, given the, the, the area, we 
should probably do it manually. And it's good, it'll keep out residential and commercial development if you have so many <laughs> places for the birds. Uh, birds, <laughs> birds are happy. What year, what year was this built? Uh, when did we put this in operation? In nine? Yeah, so I, I, it's Bayside, Little Neck. I don't know if you right. guys know exactly. Uh, we, we can we can get the drainage area. We'll show you exactly yeah, where it is. Exactly. A little bit of Douglas. So just while we're here, this is John Petito, who's in charge of the Bureau of Wastewater Treatment, managing this. I think you all know Kevin Clark, uh, who is responsible for the Arkawanas project. And will you introduce Jerry and Paul? Because I'll never yes, get the name. These gentlemen here, um, they're in charge of the uh, Collections North crew. crew. Uh, Jerry Valgende is the division chief. Paul is the section chief of Collections North. What they do is they do the operation and maintenance of all of our pumping stations, regulators, and CSO facilities in northern Queens, the Bronx, and northern Manhattan. So um, they're responsible for coming here for operate, uh, for actually operating the pumps when we have to do a pump back to Tallman Island when we, do, we, we send the liquid, right? We do that manually and also for all the vector operations here to remove the grit that accumulates in the, in the tanks. And um, in addition, just, just to let you know too, even here, even in this space, they have to close down when they, when they mobilize in the morning and leave, they have to close down this part of Northern Boulevard for like 10 minutes. Right, to get the truck so down. if it's a much tighter area, well, you know, it, it's, it, there's gonna be much more traffic control and much more interferences. Again, just like we have at our other CSO facilities, inside the building is just uh, ductwork that suck the odorous air um, and pull it through a, a, a carbon scrubber, which we have. We just have activated charcoal at our other facilities. It absorbs the odorous material, and then periodically, once every year or two, we have to replace the carbon. But is the noise that we're hearing now also what you would hear in a head house, I guess? No, because it would be in an enclosed in, uh, facility, and uh, we also have noise abatement at our other facilities too. If we took you to Patigan, you'll see along the side of the walls, it's all the, you know, so, so many, what the community would, would really experience is just another building in the community, but not it being any different That's than right. any other building. And periodically they'd see trucks coming in and out to, to remove the containers. Which would happen with or without a head house. Without it, we'd also get the noise in Can you explain with or without a head house um, what kind of closure impacts we would experience if this were to be built at the park site? Yeah, so I think, you know, as John Petito mentioned, uh, to bring these these big trucks in, in fact, the truck just came in to remove the container, uh, to bring these big trucks in and to make the turn into the facility. For a short period of time, in the morning and then in, in the evening, we have to shut down this road out here, Northern Boulevard, you know, 10 to, 10 to 12 minutes just to get the trucks in and out. So it would probably be, be the same thing um, you know, in the Gowanus neighborhood, whatever streets we, we would need to just shut to get trucks in and out. Again, brief periods of time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. With the head, ends. with the head with, he, 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 with Either way. And, and what times are you thinking of any street closures? Morning and evening? I mean, when, when, whenever we need to. So if a container is full and we, we want to pull it out, I mean, we would work with DOT to just tell them we need whatever at 10 o'clock this morning. We need the street closed to get our container out. I mean, without, I'm without, just thinking we have a house when the kids are out on uh, the we want streets. Jerry said we wouldn't have to shut down with a headhouse. Okay, so explain well, I, that. Yeah, I, I, so do, we, do we know right? that? Would it turn? The, the most we would have to do is maybe just when the truck pulls in and out. It's right. a minute, a minute, a minute, a minute to two. Yeah, but it's not, the way. And, you know, it's not to get all these vehicles in. It's just yeah. to get the blow bugger in and out, maybe. So I'll be shorter. If we had a headhouse, shorter period of time for street. Of year we try to go as long as the sun is out. 
they'll go to six o'clock, six thirty, right? And it could and it could be Monday through Saturday, right? Yeah, you guys work Monday through Saturday. Sorry if you said this already, but about how long did it take you to excavate and build this, construct a four million gallon tank? Yeah, I don't know if anybody. I think it was about two to three years. We were we were out yeah, here at least three years. Three years. If our tank was on the canal, would you be able to take the material away by barge? Uh, I don't, Kevin. You may know. So that's something that that's something that we're exploring. We we identified it as a potential um, to reduce truck traffic in and out of the area. Are, are you talking about the material that would be removed during construction or, or during operation? Okay. Yeah, during operation. We. Uh, I don't. I don't think would make sense, uh, like the volume of material new storing operation, it would make sense to use the barge to remove the material. Uh, you would just bring a, a truck in and, and, and take it away. It just looks like any other, um, uh, you know, dumpster carrying type of truck. Uh, and then, you know, there would only be a few a day. Uh, and, but we are looking at it um, for uh, the construction. You know, it is something that we have brought up to, uh, to EPA that uh, could be a potential. Uh, the thing that we're concerned about, though, would be the interference with the activities that are taking place in the canal, uh, you know, from the dredging and the capping, and uh, the canal's not that wide, and, you know, it limits the, the size of the uh, the vessels that can be uh, used in the canal. So what we thought we'd do now is we're gonna take you over to where they actually have the hose going into the tank to vacuum it out, and then you can just take a look at how that works, and the guy's in there working. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna head over now. Just watch watch your steps, watch your backs. We're gonna walk over to see the vacuum operation. Okay, guys, crank it up. So before before we turn it we turn it on, down in this manhole, uh, this this we can take a quick look. Yeah, there's a guy we're lowering in. Yeah, just be careful. So we're lowering in a guy, and he's he's going to control the, the equipment down there. This guy gets extra hazardous. And they're going to start removing some some material. Right that?
every time you're cleaning it out, this is what happens. But in a head house, this noise is automated, so you don't hear it. Correct. We use pumps. Yeah. We use pumps to pump it out of the tank and into the containers in a head house. So it's all internal. It's all automated. It's all automated. It's all internal. So we, we just, you know, we get everything done inside. And and you asked about the noise before too. When they build, when they build these facilities, they put acoustical block in there to try, you know, to keep any yeah, yeah, it's noise attack. So we have to coordinate two things. There's two CSO facilities that pump over to the Tolman Island treatment plant in Whitestone. This facility and Flushing Bay. Yeah. So we'll try to coordinate and just figure out, you know, can we pump who's on the exactly. So if it's dry weather like this, you know, we can get both Flushing Bay and this tank pumped out in a day, day and a half. Okay. So we're gonna move over. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna go see the outdoor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, flow goes, flow, when the, when the oh, the guy's coming out of the hole. Okay, we're going to go ahead and the apple. No, it's not.
All right, just before we head over to, to the outfall, I just want to point out the ventilation system that we have here. So there's odorous air in the tank uh, that has to be evacuated before our guys get in. So we bring in this uh, system. It's just basically three large fans that, that evacuate the odorous air out of the tank, and then our guys can get in and access it. What we're going to do now is we're going to walk over to the very end where the outfall is, and that's where water leaves the tank uh, during very heavy storms. When the tank is full also, water overflows into, into the creek and you'll see Alley Creek itself. It depends upon not only how much rain falls, how many inches of rain, but also the intensity. So if it rains very intensely, you know, for a couple of hours, So this is this is Alley Creek, and we're standing at the outfall structure. When the tank uh, reaches capacity, and if it's still raining and there's still flow getting into the system that that either the tank can't take or the Tolman Island treatment plant can't take, yeah, combined sewage can overflow here into the creek uh, as part of DEP's long-term control plan for managing combined sewer overflows. Uh, we, we have teams that come in here, analyze the wastewater, the, the, the water in the creek and the wastewater from the tank uh, to determine its, its characteristics. Right. And how far down the street? Uh, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, and, and, I, and one other thing I want to point out too is, you, you, you said how, how little amount this creek is. This creek, this is about as much water as you'll see in the creek. Uh, yeah. If you come at, at low tide, it, it's basically ankle high. There's very little water here in the creek, but so this is about as much water as, as you'll see in the creek. Um, and again, it depends upon the, the overflow amounts and, and how long there's an overflow and, and as to how far downstream is affected. So do you time you your discharges to the tide? No, we can't. So the question was, can we time our discharges to the tide? As much as we'd like to, once the tank is full, if it's still raining heavily, there, there will be an overflow. Depend it, has yeah, it has to go. Sir, you have substantial boating over there. And how are those people being affected? Or do you know? Uh, we, we have data. Off the top of my head, I don't know what the data is. Any questions? But there's, there's, a, there's a, if anything, a short period when the water is, is affected because it dissipates very quickly. That's right. That's, that, that's, that's a good point, too, is that... Um, you know, if, if there is an overflow, it's generally, and, and we post this data, by the way, on our website, water, water body advisories. Mm -hmm. With the rain we had the other day, there were water body advisories posted, but generally in a 12 or 24 hour period, uh, we return back to, to compliance. Yeah. 
EPA um, expressed uh, some concerns about having tanks so close to the water's edge, but we didn't get much background on what those concerns were about or what the discussion was. If you could like shed some light on that. Yeah. Kevin, Kevin will tell you. Kevin. So the question was about why is EPA concerned about having the tanks so close to the canal? And we know about groundwater, but you can talk about that. Sure. Um, so when you are building a deep excavation uh, anywhere, uh, you have to construct uh, what's called the support of excavation first, which is basically walls that are going to support um, the hole that you're going to be digging. Um, and basically what you do is you drive sheeting into the ground and then um, what we're looking to do is construct a, a concrete wall on the outside of that tank and then as you excavate down you would support those walls from the inside and then you would build concrete walls on the inside um, for, for the tank. Um, we actually believe that the conditions are very similar um, you know, at the head end site and at the park site because the groundwater levels are so high and what you need to protect against is um, uh, the weight of the soil on the outside of, ex of the excavation as well as the hydrostatic pressure, that's the groundwater level, that wants to knock those walls over. It's a very similar condition whether you're building it at the head end site or the park because the groundwater levels are so high. And, and we build, you know, we build structures like that, um, you know, next to the water, every place. Look at New York City, you know, most of it is along the water, you know, this is something that is not very unique. And all of DEP's facilities are adjacent to the water, that's a very good point. Christos just mentioned at the CAG meeting on, on Tuesday night that you all were going to be, I think, providing additional data specific to the hydrostatic pressure. Is that, can you maybe talk a little bit about what this, that is? I, I don't know if I got that. Who else was at the CAG? You can correct me. I, I think I'm <laughs> referring to um, uh, groundwater issues. So um, there is some, we do expect to see some groundwater impacts due to some of the work that is planned. Um, not necessarily the work that, that we're doing, but the work that's planned in the canal, uh, namely the in-situ soil stabilization, as well as the cutoff wall the National Grid has to construct um, for the Upland MGP um, remediation work. And, uh, you know, Gowanus Canal is the low point, so the groundwater flows down towards the canal, and um, those two items are going to restrict um, that groundwater flow and then could cause some mounding of groundwater upland. Uh, so that's that's a conversation that we've been having recently. How deep is the hole for a four to eight million gallon tank? And um, how long does it take to, to build the, not just dig the hole, but build the tank? So um, we're looking to, the, the tank itself, the interior uh, dimensions will be about 40 feet below ground. Uh, the excavation will be a little bit deeper than that because uh, you know we've got to pour concrete on the bottom of the tank, so we're probably something on the order of 45 feet deep, something like that. Um, and we estimate that it's going to take approximately five years to construct the tank. Um, that is tank construction alone. We also know that e um, you know we're, that, that National Grid will have to do the excavation and remediation. We estimate that that's going to take about two years to complete before we start our work. My question is, when you discharge the water from here, are there any kind of filters? Can you do any filtering of? So, so, so two things happen in, in this tank, right? Um, for storms that um, don't exceed the capacity of the tank, all of the sewage is stored in the tank and it's pumped back to a wastewater treatment plant where it's treated like other sewage. Um, for storms that exceed the capacity of the tank, um, you might have an overflow that would, would pass through completely untreated. Yeah, and that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point too. So at facilities where we have head houses, there are screens that remove plastic bags, bottles, any kind of street it's trash, sticks, garbage. garbage. At this facility, there's no head house, there are no screens. So if, if a plastic bottle washed into this tank, it would But my overflow question is, out. I'm talking, right, it, it, there's excess of, that exceeds the capacity. And I think the Gowanus Canal, we said it before, at the Gowanus Canal, it's only expected to, uh, to eliminate 70% of the raw sewage. So that other 30% would come through something like this. And I'm just wondering, is there, can you put any like rough screens to keep out the heavy stuff? Yeah, that's, that's it's what we're it's doing, a very yeah. good point that, that you're bringing up. We actually want to be as protective of the canal as possible. And so even for those storms, the way that we have currently uh, designed the facility for Gowanus, even for the storms that will result in an overflow that's going to pass through the tank, you will receive 
a rough screening at the head end of the tank to remove all of the larger debris. And then what we're putting on the end are what we're calling polishing screens um, to remove any smaller debris. Something on the order of any, anything bigger than roughly half an inch would get captured in the tank and not make its way into the canal. So that you're removing a lot of you know, plastic debris, anything that could wash off the streets, anything that you know somebody could flush down the toilet will hopefully not make it into the canal under that. Yes. Yeah, but well, you're not removing any of the bacteriologicals at all. Right. But with at the last community board, uh, the community board uh, session that we had, someone brought up the point that there's a parcel of land that's available for sale that's right next to the park. What, whether that was considered as a viable option, and I think the answer was basically no, it was considered to be not a viable option. I know that people still have questions about that. Is there any more information you can give us about that? So those parcels. The, the, the parcel that is for sale is not small enough for the entire tank, but we had looked at that parcel plus a couple of other parcels just to the not east. Not big enough. Not, not big enough. I'm I was sorry. like, not small enough. I was like, this is different it's engineering. I don't even know. Excuse me. I'm sorry. So we had looked at that parcel yeah. as well as several other parcels to the east of that parcel okay. for, and that was actually our third selected site for the tank. So what we've been asked to do right now is to take a closer look at that at this point because a portion of that uh, property, a portion of that tank site is for sale. Right. So we're looking at that now. So you have the outflow uh, because of the capacity going into the canal. Uh, is it feasible to build in a secondary treatment for that outflow? Yeah. So, 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 you know, I guess this goes back to our DEP's uh, whole long-term control plan for CSOs. Back in the 1980s, we only captured about 20% of the combined sewage uh, that, during extreme wet weather. Um, and during dry weather, everything got treated, but, but in wet weather, we only had about 20% capture. We're over 80% now, and that's the investment that you know all New Yorkers have made uh, over the last 20 years to improve CSO capture. And we have, again, part of our plan going forward is to reduce that even further. But that last 10%, if you want to capture that, you just have to have tremendously large storage tanks and, and if you want to capture every overflow, I don't know if that's affordable. No, no, that's not exactly what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that even if you didn't want to take that last 10, you're still going to have polluted water eventually getting directly into the canal. And what would it take just to remove some of those bacteriologicals, ultraviolet or whatever, and yeah. still let the water continue to flow? Right. So some of the things we are looking at, again, as part of our long-term control plan is disinfection of those overflows. Right. There's a lot of concerns though about if, if you use, like we use now, we use basically bleach. Um, that can impact marine biota. I talked about this, this creek itself. On many days it's only ankle deep. If you have anything in there and we're adding chlorine to a tank like this, what does that do? If you do UV disinfection, we say, well great, you know, we'll just zap everything with ultraviolet light. That uses a lot of energy. So somewhere there's a, a electrical generating plant that's emitting pollutants into the air. So do we want to, you know, reduce bacteria with UV? You know, somewhere in in the, the ecosystem, um, you know, there, there's some detriment. So I I cannot talk for the neighborhood, but if you took a vote, I would imagine that they would like to see less bacteriologicals flowing into the canal and the hell with the amount of power being used. We also have been charged by the administration to re reduce our energy use very significantly. So I understand why you would feel that way, but our responsibility is to balance. Uh, we also think about how much money we invest. I mean, as a matter of equity, we're investing a huge, huge, huge amount of money into this neighborhood and that means it's money we can't put in other neighborhoods who have similar problems. Maybe not super fun, but we're really not talking about super fun when we talk about CSOs. We're really talking about the basic sewage system. So we're trying to balance all of those things. Yeah, Commissioner, there was a question here about green infrastructure and how that's yeah. helping to reduce CSOs. I think the green infrastructure is, is a significant help because obviously it can absorb a lot of water. The other thing, um, that I think is going to help is the high level storm sewers because um, it's going to reduce the amount of storm water. You know, the sewer system probably, the sewer lines probably use somewhere between 
10 and maybe 20 percent at the most uh, of the capacity for raw sewage. The rest is stormwater. So what does get released, a very small portion of it has any contamination in it uh, other than what's in the, the stormwater. So um, again, it's just a, it's a matter of balance. I mean, if we had all the money in the world and all the land in the world and weren't worried about greenhouse gas reduction, um, you know, we'd, we'd agree with you that everything ought to be captured and treated everywhere. Cart uh, before the horse, but uh, questions about in terms of like transporting this material and truck access and stuff like that is has that already been started? Is the conversation started to happen about that? Like how that would happen and what corridors would be used in the scenario that you guys are proposing? Kevin, are you, are you talking about construction or during operation? Or? Both. I mean, I think kind of both is the idea. So. Uh, you know, during during construction, we're assuming it would just be you know Third Avenue right. to uh, to the Gowanus Expressway. Right. Um, operation, I'm not really sure. I, you know, it, it might be a similar route uh, depending on how. I'm assuming this would go to Wards Island. Yeah. So uh, the truck would have to find its way to the BQE. Um, Got it. So it's just just standard routing and everything. But the, would, there wouldn't there wouldn't be a would there be a dedicated access point for those trucks? In other words, or during construction or operation? Operation. Sorry. Okay, during operation, absolutely. Yeah. There, yeah. there would be a, um, uh, a like a roll-up door in, in a garage bay. A garage the bay. truck would, okay. would back in, pick up the container, and then take off. In a non-penthouse situation, obviously, there's some, some part that would have to be used for staging, for ongoing, like, that would accommodate that kind of truck traffic. Absolutely. It, it would look similar to this. Kevin, did you talk about the, if there is not a headhouse, to maybe point out the hatches that are here and sort of what roles those play? and. Sure. Um, so, you know, even if you are able to, you know, maintain a park or open space above the tank, you know, you're going to have to get into the tank somehow. And that's what each of these hatches are that you see here. These, you know, it, it, it would certainly be configured very differently, but you would need to be able to provide um, ventilation, you know, for the people that need to get into the tank. You need to provide access points for the guys to get down there. Um, the size of those tanks and the size of those hatches and you know the layout could be very different from here but you're going to need them and then you know obviously then there's space around those hatches for all of the equipment associated with you know ventilating and accessing and cleaning the tank and our, our law department and, we think that, and the parks department think that is and the legal history is that that's alienation uh, there's no question that constitutes alienation um, less so than the head house, but uh, to some degree anyway. So uh, EPA feels they can override that because of Superfund, and so that's an area where you'll, you know, you'll hear both sides. We just we're not in agreement. Are you, um, are you talking? Um, of working with National Grid to understand um, the 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 L Napple and the D Napple, and sort of how that will um, also get into. The, um, the sewage tanks and sort of how to deal with that issue? Are you guys working together? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we coordinate with National Grid all the time. As recently as, uh, what's our last meeting? Tuesday? <laughs> last Tuesday. More to talk about construction schedules. Um, you know, we don't see any real mechanisms for, you know, uh, contamination to enter the tank. Um, you know, the tank would be completely waterproof, meaning nothing's leaking out, nothing's leaking in, other than the sewage that's being carried into the tank. Um, in addition, there's a significant amount of re remediation that's going to take place, um, you know, uh, within the tank footprint as well as outside of the tank footprint. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm completely answering your question. The underground, the groundwater is still having any of that um, coal tar waste that would get into the tank and then could either exit into the canal or would make it to the sewage treatment plant. Right. The groundwater issue. You know, I, I think it's something that's still being explored. You know, there are ways to treat the groundwater. You know, if, if we do find that there's going to be a significant mounding impact, you know, some sort of relief would have to be provided in order to uh, prevent adverse impacts of that mounding. And, you know, if you are relieving it into the canal, you know, you might have to provide some treatment of that groundwater until it's clean. What, what are the ways that you deal with mounding? Um, you could pump a tree. Literally, you pump the water out of the ground. Um, that's not something we typically look to do, you know, for something that is going to be a long-term uh, type of uh, problem. And so you can provide some passive relief, which is literally just um, a pipe uh, that, 
Yeah, exactly. And, you know, we, it could be a French drain. You know, that's what we call them, or a reverse French drain. And um, you know, there are several ways to provide treatment. Um, you know, sometimes microbes are used that literally uh, digest uh, the um, petroleum-based compounds. Um, you can inject the ground with uh, with oxygen you know, to feed those micro mi microbes, as well as uh, just provide some real oxidation of the, of the material. So there's a lot of ways to do it, and I, you know, I, I shouldn't be the one to, to speak to it. I'm just talking conceptually. Probably, These are things yeah. that could do, that, that could be done. Can, can can you guys talk a little bit about the um, difference in level and excavation that would be required for DEP to uh, reach for the tanks as opposed to what National Grid would need to do for the cleanup and where the difference is? Sure. Uh, I, I believe most of the excavation that National Grid would have to be performed is limited to roughly 20 feet below the ground surface. Um, there are some structures on the park site that might be a little bit deeper, but not, not that much deeper. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, we're looking to go, you know, to something roughly to 45 feet below the ground surface. So you're going down an extra 20 feet. That means you're going to hit a lot of coal tar. Potentially. What will happen? I mean, you're going to... It would, be, it would be removed and, and, and uh, disposed of off-site. And will DEP pay for that or National Grid? We believe it's National Grid's responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I don't, that's something that needs to be worked out. Uh, you know, Ted and I, we met on Tuesday, and you know we're going to continue talking about that, exactly how that will look. But the main thing is that we're coordinating. We're trying to come up with a plan that will let this happen. Dovetailing with the budget question, I mean, there are a number of distinct things happening. Clean up. There's a tank that's being built. There's a temporary park, and then there's a permanent park. How how is all of this looked at from a comprehensive standpoint? Yeah, and you know, is it all one bucket? Is it different buckets? And what are the buckets? Not the amounts, but like who owns them? And I think one of the things the community is interested in is kind of like the assurances that stuff is is going to be dedicated and protected in those areas. I can speak to the schedule. Uh, you know, we're we're looking at multiple scenarios uh, and and each individual piece. Um, you know, everything from land acquisition to um, the remediation and excavation work that would have to take place, the construction of temporary parks if we were going to, uh, to the park site. Um, you know, that's something we're spending a lot of time on right now. Um, it's a budget. And I think overall, at the end of the day, EPA will have to coordinate it all because they are the ones who uh, approve or order what's going to be done. And we, the last time we met with them, they said they were pleased to hear that we were in conversation with National Grid about a lot of things, and DEC is also involved in it. They have they have a role as well. Um, so I think the four of us, at, at this point, most of the time, we're having tag team conversations and keeping each other informed, but pretty soon it'll be time for everybody to sort of have an integrated plan. It's, it's part of, you know, these conversations yeah. as well? Yeah, okay, yeah. got it. I suppose that because we're on camera, there's no point in my asking how your working relationship is with EPA. Am I correct? I actually think it's quite good. I really think it's gotten a lot better over the last couple of years. I think once once we said, okay, you know, we understand, we've been ordered, we're going to do it. Uh, we we have we'll have a lot to say about where we think it should go, and we'll have a lot to say about how big we think it needs to be and the layout of the conveyance. Uh, and that sort of thing, but I think once we got to that point, things started to get quite a bit better. I think a lot of um, the issues that we've been hearing sort of um, from on the ground level, from the, commu from the community's perspective at the CAG meetings, is that, you know, there's a, a fundamental distrust between um, the city agencies, the state agencies, and the federal agencies. Um, and the biggest issue seems to be, right now, from my perspective, um, the biggest issue seems to be the, the differences in the opinion of how long it would take if um, you cited the tank, you know, on the Nevin Street Canal side versus at the um, pool and park site. Um, what assurances can you give us that, you know, um, DEP is going to be adhering to these timelines? Um, what guarantees, and can you just talk about that? Bit. Well, I think, I think that's really in discussion now, but we have uh, the, the people in our law department, that is to say the city law department and uh, the city department of administration services, known as DCAS, who do 
uh, all the purchase of land for the city and ultimately do the condemnation if that's necessary, are very involved in this. We've given a very detailed presentation uh, to EPA about what we think the timeline would be best case and worst case, citing many examples uh, to date on uh, projects in the city. Um, so I think that we, um, I think that we have gained some credibility about that with them because again, as with, as with what we do at the edge of the water, we do this all the time, uh, or the city does this all the time, and we do it with some frequency. Um, and so I think that um, probably if whatever site that they ultimately order us to, I think they will want us to sign on to a timetable that has penalties attached to it. And I think from our point of view, where there's still quite a few unknowns in terms of the sequencing of things and the time that will be involved to roll it out, we're going to be wary about signing on to something with big financial penalties if we think there are pieces of it we can't deliver on. Um, so I think that that will be a conversation that has to start happening soon. And I don't know where that will end up. Because if we feel their timeline is unreasonable, we're going to be, particularly our law, law department is going to be very loath for us to sign on to something that we don't believe can be accomplished. Commissioner, actually, can I ask a question? Yeah. So following up on what you said about the I don't know alien. if I should be oh. handing this around Sorry. to everybody. <laughs> I feel like I'm hogging it. You're like Donahue or something. Right, exactly. Um, <laughs> People who remember, sorry. Um, so you had mentioned alienation before, and I think we've been trying to understand sort of the, that disagreement. I think our understanding, and I don't want to speak for the EPA, but is that everybody seems to agree that both the temporary and potentially permanent loss of any parkland would be alienation. Our understanding, and I think Walter Mugden said this at the community board meeting, was that any alienation that was required, the EPA would order that to be corrected by essentially kind of creating equivalent park space someplace else. Um, I think a lot of, you know, all of us have sort of tried to figure out, well, what does that really mean in practice? And obviously I'm assuming that that's part of the conversation. I don't know if there's anything yeah. even, but I guess both whether that's accurate and also whether there have been conversations about what really the temporary, yeah, where would where would both the temporary and like really the permanent in particular space? Go? I think I think the position that jointly we and uh, the Parks Department have arrived at, and Mitch Silver has been in a lot of these meetings, um, is that we have we really want to support the best cleanup and we want to minimize the impact on the park both in terms of how long it's under construction and we would like to avoid there being a permanent facility there um, and so I think that the all of us agree that if we're there it will be impacted the park will be impacted and that it will be impacted even short term if we're not there the question is where do you find land? And I think uh, temporary space uh, that would be commensurate with what's available at the park is going to be almost impossible to accomplish, but I think one or more smaller parcels that could provide some amenities, particularly a temporary pool, is something that can be accomplished. I think long-term finding space to do something that would be replaced the amount that we would disrupt the park with a permanent head house is going to be much more difficult. And Mitch's uh, position on that is that there's no substitute for a park that's contained within the four blocks. He says, you know, it's like taking away my kitchen or my living room and my home. You know, you want people to be able to use the whole park as a self-contained entity. Different parts of the family are using different parts of it. Parts of it. He cites other parks where they have done additions uh, that are disconnected and separated by streets, and he just feels it's not as good a park. So he feels very strongly about keeping the park intact without the intrusion of our facility in it. And it's way too early to even think about the size of the pool, the replacement pool at this moment. It's way too early, I think, but I think everyone would like it to be optimized. And, well, actually, can I, that's, that brings up a question. So you said 45 feet deep, and they'd be about 20 feet deep. But obviously, if there's a pool, the depth is going to have to drop even further. Is that, does that account for that part, the well, pool? You know, we, we feel or, that the pool might or, be slightly elevated. Up. Yeah, that's all. What about the cost estimates? Do you have a better, can you just give us a rundown of where the cost estimates are right now for each option? Um, I don't know if I can do it off the top of my head. Ken probably can, but we are not beyond. We are not beyond where we were when we said we're at a, a, a level of estimate that 
that is considered that it could drop 30% or go up 50%. And that if you take, I think you've seen the presentation, that if you take the different components and look at the, the uncertainties, we're considering, even though we still think the Heda Canal site might be less expensive, who knows what will happen at the end with the acquisition, we think it's pretty much a wash. What we think would be most expensive uh, would be, and, and, and sort of the worst of both worlds, would be to put the tanks under the park and do a remote head house. That to us is the least efficient and most costly, so that's an idea we really don't like. And, and we still, in terms of the timetable, we would still have to do acquisition for that. So it doesn't help with how much time might be used up by going through the acquisition slash condemnation process. Have you spoken with um, the, the city administration, with the de Blasio administration, to, about these projected costs um, for eminent domain? Um, have, have they, they've seen our costs. Um, and that our suspicion is, although it might not be paid for by us, that by the time we acquired additional uh, park land and built that out, uh, that that would probably balance out the cost of the acquisition for the site we prefer. But I think, you know, in, in that area where there is so much speculation already in terms of property acquisition, I don't think that... Um, I don't think that we can assume that any parcel is going to be cheap or easy or unchallenged in terms of what the fair market value is, you know. But at the end of the day, the court process is one that generally allows work to start on the site while you argue about what fair market value is. And all of the site owners who have contamination are probably going to be interested in having that contamination cleaned up. So our hope is that, regardless how it goes forward, that they would be willing to have a cleanup start, that we could strike some kind of a deal about that. Following up on Ben's question about coordination, uh, you know, it just occurs to me that, you know, it's, it's good, obviously, that the conversations are going on between DEP and National Grid as part of the thinking through. Um, just. But obviously, what, what might be built on top of, in terms of a uh, permanent park, uh, if it is in the current park, that, that, that overlay of thinking in the design is much better to happen very soon, I would think, in this process. At what point does that become a, a consideration in terms of the timing about where the park design becomes a component of, of really thinking about the comprehensive project? We've, we've prepared conceptually conceptual designs for both locations with the park on top of the park site as well as conceptual design for and that's included in the price. Yes, yes. Do do do, do, do we do, do we have do you have designs that you can show green. us? We don't really have a rendering. I mean, <laughs> you know, parks would do the design. They're not gonna start doing the design until they know where it is. Whether or not the tank is going to be underneath it, which would mean they would have to elevate that end of the of the park and you know they might decide to put something else there and put the pool in the middle who knows and, want a community and they would want to <laughs> and they would and and they would as well they think that's very important and then there are all these other technicalities like under the city budget you can't use capital money to design a project that ha that isn't in the budget yet and you have to use operating money which which nobody likes to do because it's much more expensive than in that year than, uh, than using capital money. So Parks is probably not going to start design until they know what they're designing to. And, and at the uh, CAG, we were, uh, regarding the head house roof, we were talking about a green roof possibility and uh, various other community uses of the roof itself. Have you built that into your design? Um, not specifically. Again, you know, this is all open for discussion, but we have been you know, considering things like uh, collecting rainwater on the roof and using that in the flushing of, uh, of the tanks after a rain event. This way you reduce water consumption and that sort of thing. So yes and no. You know, I think, I think we would be open to those types of discussions. But it's, it's very early, you know. But right I, now, I would say having up. built a two-level facility in a park a few years ago in Prospect Park, um, the, the access to that to right. be uh, accessible would take up a lot of the park if you wanted to get people up 
uh, on top in, a, in an easy moving way. Very dramatically sloping. Yeah. Given the uncertainty in the budget, I mean, it sounds like a big range could be under 30% over 50%, et cetera. Um, we've certainly seen in construction projects that oftentimes as that budget gets bigger, that things get cut, a lot of times landscape and parks. Um, again, what kind of, how, how do you talk to the community about assurances around that? I know it's also, the, it, it's, it's a lot of uncertainty for, for you all, so you can't really answer the question directly, but I think it is gonna be a very important question folks to know is there some kind of guarantee that that park is going to get made and that money is protected for that specific reason rather than be like hey we're in cap and guess what you know yeah. and i i don't think i can answer that yeah. question i, I think the parks know. department has to answer yeah. that's that all question that's and, and it will it you know there's so much i, I think know, there's, there's a general expectation that there's going to have to be a commensurate amount of parkland wherever it is. Right. Who pays for it and how much money it is it's still, is okay. just still, you. you know, in the ether, I think. Okay. Except for, I think the administration is very committed to, you know, through Mitch having there be, as are we. I mean, if you look at Absolutely. any place else where we've done Flushing Meadow, Van Cortland Park, <laughs> you know, we've, we have yeah, I really don't, done. I, I don't think anyone doubts that. It's just, as you said, like the, the level of uncertainty is high in a project right. that this, that's right. this complex. And, right. and I think that that, that makes the community nervous right. Right. in terms of what then results yeah, and what's going to get cut. So, yeah. And just to clarify, that level of uncertainty is just based on where we are in the design. design process. Yeah. As design progresses, you know, get more certainty more. about. Right. As more of these decisions sort of get made. Right, right. right. You right. can refine those numbers. Right. You're at 30%. Not even. Okay, any other questions? Do you have any idea when um, yeah. the anticipation, <laughs> when we can't anticipate a decision being made in this process? You know, it feels to me like it's very actively in conversation now. Um, and I think that, uh, so, but I don't know what that means in terms of how EPA does things. This is our, this is our first super fun uh, site. So I think that it's, um, you know, over, oh, it, over the next few months, I would say, you know, a few months, uh, there's a lot of conversation still to take place, but there's a lot of discussion going on. Actually, can I ask a follow-up on that? Is, I, mean, I mean, really, what is a decision going to look like? I mean, so thinking about the alienation issues, um, I mean, if they cited the tank under the park, whether that would be a potentially challengeable alienation would really depend on what, what the requirements and contingencies that were built into that decision were. And so, like, really, like, are we going to get a decision of is it going to be here or there, or is it going to have to be a you know, much more complicated, negotiated plan that accompanies that? Do you know which will? My which impression is that they will, that it will be an order to a site, and ev everything, and everything else will follow. Will, will follow. Right. Yeah, that's my, but that's my impression. I, without. There are lawyers here, and our lawyers here. I'm, I'm hesitant, <laughs> hesitant to speak. So right. two or three years from now, we're going to have the same conversation about the creek, all right? About Newtown. Uh, yes, we are. But but Except I think no I think we I think we're all getting better at it. You know, I hope. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you all so much for making making the trip and giving us the time. Really appreciate. It. Thank you, National Grid, for joining us. You guys have anything you want to say? Of course, I'm handing you the mic. The mic is amplified. We're good. We were just very interested in what you had to say and to see what the facility looks like, and it's certainly of interest to us as well as everyone else. Yeah, good. Thanks All right. for inviting us. Thanks we appreciate for coming. it. Yeah. Oh yeah, but you want to see the which final part of the operation? Area, which is the uh, dumping And thank you so much. Yeah, we're, thank, we're you. Doing really. yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy.
Okay, um, this is after, after we do the vectoring and the vector is, and the vector truck is full, we usually, we, de we try to decant as much of the liquid as possible back into the tanks. This way, we could try to capture mostly, mostly solid material that we can put into the, into the containers. So we just like you to see this is what will happen. Every time we have to vector, and we have to dump from the vector into a tank where we do not have a head house. This, uh, this operation is, is kind of messy, so we're keeping you 30, 40, 50 feet back. It has a power takeoff, the back opens up and it'll, and it'll slide right out. Deputy Superintendent said is even even after we right, even after we try to get most of the the, uh, the liquid out, what happens is as you as you dump, you still have you, you still have retained water in there that has to come out. No matter you know, no matter how good a job we do in trying to decant what's in the truck.
got splashed. I think I got splashed. Yeah, gross. water tank uh, that is attached to each vac the truck and the the water is used to flush out all of the material once you know once we we dump most of it and there's still residual material in there we have a 500 gallon tank of water which sprays the container and gets all the material out wow. so would they do this on the playground they bring that's the way we'd have to do it, yes, because then we'd have to, we'd have to, then start vectoring operations again. As we said, we would, we would continue to vector for six days, so we would probably be dumping several times a day into a container, and probably go through at least one container a day. On a plate. For about, yeah, one to two containers a day for about five days, six days. Then you close the park, or you close the playground, you bring the... Well, it depends on where it would be. I don't, you know, it depends on where everything would be. But we'd have to have access to the tanks. We've all taken uh, some, not sewage, sludge, and even we've been hit with chlorine because yeah. we use chlorine for disinfection, liquid chlorine, yeah. you know, uh, sodium hypochlorite. It's a more concentrated Clorox. Like ten times, right? Ten times the Clorox. Uh, Clorox is about four uh, percent. What we use is about eleven percent chlor chlorine. You know, um, chlorine bleach. So it's uh, about two and a half times to three times. Okay. You, so you need this, or do you want me to give it to somebody else? I'll take it. Okay, you're going back with them? 